Now, what I thought that you'd be interested in is my views uh, or my assessment of whether Britain uh, is heading for exit uh, from the European Union. Yes. Um, now, opinion polls suggest that it might be, um, but then opinion polls have always been fairly bad uh, from a pro-European point of view uh, in Britain. Um, and uh, there was a recent analysis uh, done by Peter Kellner, who runs the YouGov polling organization, um, which uh, looked in detail at attitudes towards European, uh, the European Union. Um, it showed that there were a very substantial minority of uh, voters who are extremely hostile, over 40%. Um, but nonetheless, it suggested that uh, if there was a, a referendum in which the uh, political leadership of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party uh, were both saying that we should stay in, uh, that uh, in all probability uh, a majority would be won uh, for that point of view. Uh, and that, I think, is still broadly my view, that it's, it is difficult, uh, but a referendum could be won. But the key question, of course... Uh, is the political leadership mm. and whether the political leadership to make the case for Britain staying in uh, is going to be there. Um, and the worry, of course, uh, is the Conservative Party, um, which, and the question is, is to what extent is the anti-European trajectory of the Conservative Party uh, something that is firmly set uh, something that increases very considerably the risk that uh, Britain will find itself out. Now, I think at the moment, it, these questions are not actually very clear. Um, I think genuinely, when the coalition government started in June 2010, I suppose I shouldn't say this on the record, but I actually thought that they that, uh, was quite positive uh, about their European policy, that the Conservatives and Lib Dems seemed to be trying to make a success of, uh, of Britain's membership, that the, the argument was, of course, thus far and no further. They were not prepared to contemplate any further integrative steps um, that affecting Britain without a referendum, but in terms of where we, where we were then, uh, they were prepared uh, to try and make it work. And initially, uh, uh, David Cameron and George Osborne and William Hague, I think, were well received in other uh, European capitals. Uh, and if you remember, um, an early success was that David Cameron agreed to the uh, ratification of a treaty to establish the European stability mechanism in the early stages of the crisis um, uh, with uh, Mrs. Merkel. He agreed that with Mrs. Merkel. Um, and then, but by the last December, we had the situation where Britain where David Cameron exercised this veto, actually it wasn't a veto because the fiscal treaty still went ahead, uh, but uh, refused uh, to uh, allow Britain to take part in it. So um, we, the coalition started off quite well, um, uh, but difficulties uh, have been uh, encountered. Um, now the present situation is this, that there is no real clarity about what, where the, what the Conservative policy is on Europe for the future. There is a lot of talk about using the possibility of uh, uh, further treaty change, which is likely to be necessary if further integration is going to take place uh, in the Eurozone, uh, and a political, some sort of political union is to come about. There's a lot of talk about how this would provide the opportunity for a renegotiation uh, of Britain's uh, position within the uh, EU. Very heavy hints of a referendum on the outcome of such a negotiation have been dropped. However, David Cameron has not committed himself absolutely to a referendum. He talks about the need to secure the consent of the people uh, in either a referendum or a general election. 
Um, so it's unclear, actually, what the position is. It's all very vague. Now, what's brought about this change from June 2010 to where we are now, the positive start to, the, to this rather confused picture, um, is first, I think, the euro crisis um, con has the depth of the euro crisis has um, convinced a lot of conservative euro skeptics that they were right all along about the euro, about the euro. Uh, they believe that the remorseless logic of in what they describe as the remorseless logic of integration involved in the euro um, will uh, create an opportunity for the renegotiation of the terms of British uh, membership, and it's just taken for granted that the the kind of integration that's involved, things like the banking union, that Britain couldn't conceivably be part of it. And it's not very obvious to me that actually that should be so, that there might well be quite strong national interest reasons why at least Britain should explore uh, whether uh, it could be a, a member or some kind of associate member uh, of a banking union. Um, so the euro crisis has brought all this to the fore. But what it's revealed is a much deeper uh, conservative skepticism about the European Union. Um, there are very, very few uh, enthusiastic Europeans uh, left uh, in the Conservative Party. Um, and the modern conservative vision of Britain's place in the world is remarkably one where they are quite happy to see Britain in an outer tier uh, of uh, the European Union, uh, and they assume that if that, uh, that uh, if Britain can stay in that outer tier, uh, we can retain the benefits uh, of the single market. Now, this is this position, welcoming an outer tier, welcoming as it were, welcoming positively, welcoming an outer tier role for Britain, is a very very big change. It's a big change from the policy of every British government uh, since uh, Harold Macmillan uh, in the early 60s, um, which was to that Britain must be at the centre of the European uh, Union. Um, and it's also very different, incidentally, from the traditional anti-European position which in Britain, which was always a very sovereigntist position. And the people who are the traditional anti-Europeans, they basically don't support this line about uh, the Eurozone's got to uh, integrate more. What they think is that the Euro is bound to fail, and it'll be very good for Britain if the whole thing breaks up, and if it brings uh, the uh, breakup of the European Union with it, uh, so much the better. Um, now, that is the position of the traditional anti-Europeans, but it is not the position of the new Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party um, who are very skeptical about Europe but want uh, Britain to stay uh, in the single market. Now, these people are a mixture of, there are some people like Liam Fox who are are basically pro-American Atlanticist neocons and think that the key, Britain's key relationship should be with the United States. There are some people who have a, a very deregulatory vision uh, of uh, Britain's future, who are basically the, the continuers of the Thatcherite revolution, who think that in order to continue the Thatcherite revolution, we have to be out of Europe because <coughs> Europe is holding us back. And there are, or at least in a, where, where the burden of EU regulation is much less than it presently is. And there are, but there are also, and I think this is the kind of what I'd call the Cameroon globalizers, the people who think that um, uh, the EU is basically an old-fashioned concept for the global world. It's a sort of protectionist block where the real opportunities for the future are in, are in India and China and Brazil and uh, Latin America. Uh, these, these, Nigeria, these are the countries uh, where Britain, because of its unique global reach, uh, uh, can enjoy uh, prosperity. Um, and uh, it's through relations with them that we can enjoy prosperity. 
Um, and the European Union is basically uh, an irrelevance. Now, uh, that feeling is quite strong, and you saw it in, in David Cameron's speech at the Conservative Party conference yesterday, uh, where he was doing the line, you know, about uh, some, some people are going to succeed in this world, some states are going to fail, uh, but we've got to be in a position, put ourselves in a position to compete to succeed. Now, um, um, what does that mean about where they think the relationship with the EU is going? I think there's a spectrum of view in the Conservative Party. Uh, some people think that... Um, uh, you know, would like to 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 simply to secure. I think a re, uh, a, um, a, a, a the, once again secure the social chapter opt out. That would be enough uh, to keep them happy. Uh, they want to be free of EU social regulation. But a lot of the people on the Conservative backbenches who are talking about renegotiation are talking about opting out of justice and home affairs. Uh, they are talking about opting out of the structural funds. Uh, they talk about the burden of regulation in a much broader sense than simply social regulation. They're talking about environmental regulation, consumer regulation. Um, in fact, there's an inconsistency, I think, because they... They, they claim they support the single market, but they don't support the, 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 the regulation, uh, the role of the commission, the role of the court in enforcing the single market and taking it forward. Um, so I think that there, is a, there, there are ambitions uh, to renegotiate the relationship, which I think are almost certainly unachievable um, uh, in terms... Uh, of practicality and what other people are likely to accept. What, the, what I think this new generation of conservatives do is greatly exaggerate the strength of Britain's negotiating position uh, inside uh, the EU uh, 28, as it will soon be. Um, they think that the other euro acts should be on Britain's side, when in fact, of course, that's not the case, and it's been the, quite a shock to them how upset uh, people like the Swedes are uh, and the Poles uh, with some of the attitudes that Britain has struck in the last year. Um, they forget that, uh, uh, although it makes good copy in the British press to denounce the euro, uh, uh, as that greatly upsets uh, our partners who are in uh, the euro. And also I think there's a bit of a political tide the other way, um, uh, in Europe, which is going to make life more and more, more difficult for the Conservatives, not, uh, not uh, easier. And the obvious point here uh, is the uh, election of President Hollande, uh, the possible return of the Social Democrats to government in Germany next September as part of some grand coalition, uh, their emphasis of uh, France and Germany on policies like a financial transactions tax, these are going to make things much more difficult uh, to achieve this renegotiation, uh, not uh, easier. Now, I think David Cameron probably senses uh, that um, this is all very difficult territory for him. Um, I think he also probably senses uh, that if it did come uh, to a referendum in which uh, he uh, was advocating a set of renegotiated terms for staying in, which is what he claims he would do. Uh, he has made statements saying that he would never campaign for Britain's exit from the European Union, uh, that this would completely split the Conservative Party, completely split it between the business community, uh, which would suddenly realize uh, that uh, a lot of uh, its economic interests were, were very severely threatened by the prospect of EU exit, um, and, uh, and the kind of nationalist um, uh, rank and file of the Conservative Party. So I don't think he knows, I don't think he has a strategy for taking this forward. I think it's all tactics. Now, the danger with tactics uh, is that I always remember there's a, a very uh, famous um, 
article that I once read anyway. I think I think it's a good article um, by a, a professor called Jim Bulpit uh, about Britain and the European Union. It was in the, uh, uh, the book about the big ideas in British politics that David Markham did about 15 years ago. Uh, and one of the points that, Bul that Bulpit made about mm -hmm. Europe in British politics is he used the, 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 the German expression, prima der Innenpolitik, Olaf, if I've got it light, right. The, the basically, this is, Europe is, is it, the problem is not the British public. The problem is the way that the European issue is played in the high politics of Britain. Right? It's the way that it's used uh, by um, uh, politicians in order to advance their interests, of, not often in internal party ma uh, questions, uh, rather than uh, in um, rather than in electoral terms. Um, and one of the famous instances of this, of course, was that was that Harold Wilson uh, in the early 70s was turned round uh, from a position of having supported uh, British membership into a position of arguing for. Uh, a renegotiation, and initially he sounded as though he wanted to come out, but he didn't and never actually said that. Uh, but what turned him round was not the facts of the case, uh, but the fact that uh, Jim Callaghan uh, made a very provocative speech in which he said, uh, in which he suggested that uh, he would win the Labour leadership if he came out. Uh, for an anti, uh, by coming out for an anti-European position. And that inner politics is very important. Now, what's the inner politics for the future for Cameron? Uh, can he rely on the core group of people around him in the Conservative Party to pursue a successful renegotiation strategy in the way that Harold Wilson did in the 70s, remembering that he's going to have to pretend in this renegotiation that he's achieved far more than in practice he actually has, because he's not actually going to achieve very much. So what he's got to have is a, is a, is a group of people who are prepared to claim that much has been achieved when, in fact, much hasn't. So I think that this is very, very problematic indeed. I'm not going to make a forecast as to what uh, will happen. But as a pro-European, I'm jolly worried. Thank you very much indeed, Roger.